my name is Amy. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, two very, very short stories for you. Um, they're both set in London, and they both involve an expat, uh, expat American community, um, and the stories are interlinked, so some of the characters kind of follow on. Um, the first story is called Sand. Kyle said it was nothing as he rubbed his eye. He gouged his thumb into the socket and rolled it round a few times until he heard a click. I'm double jointed, he explained through the tears. Kyle squinted, even though it was an overcast, typically British day. We were in the park, in the middle of a failed Fourth of July beach party, complete with a sand pit and volleyball and flags and sprinklers. It was an expat party organized by an annoying woman called Debbie Chang, who lived in my block of flats. She was from California and urged us to cling to our American heritage like it was some life raft amongst the heathen ways of the crumbling British Empire. <laughs> I had agreed to do my bit for America by saying I would do the face paint while Kyle, my new friend from Kentucky, signed up for the barbecue. I had zero painting skills and I hated children. <laughs> Kyle, on the other hand, was a bit of an expert barbecuer. You could call it his party USP. It was one of those parties, a party full of expats, full of their own USPs and English American files who told bad jokes. I painted four kids' faces. The first kid looked distinctly unhappy with the results. I want my money back. Shove off, I told him. He returned with his mom. The second, I made cry. After the fourth unhappy child left my booth, Debbie came over. She wore a glittery top hat with American flag colors. She smiled brightly and brought over a quiet American girl called Cecily. Hey, how's it going? Ready for a break? Debbie asked. No, nah, not really. I'm having a really great time here. Cecily and Debbie stared down at my messy workstation. Face paint splashed all over one another. Glitter all over the table. Seth, this is Cecily. She's really keen to help you out. So if you want to take a break, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Hi, Cecily, I said. She limply shook my hand. Where are you from? I'm from Ohio. Oh. <laughs> Debbie seemed unimpressed with our exchange. Cecily's a fine artist, and she's a really big up-and-coming name. She's got a show here in Europe. Great, I said, watching some guy dressed as a hot dog fall over his wiener. <laughs> Cecily and Debbie looked disturbed. Well, I'll be wandering around if you need me. Both of you, have fun. Cecily sat down on the camping stool and started rearranging the paints. Honestly, if you want to take a break, be my guest. <laughs> Fuck it, I thought. I grabbed a beer from the cooler, went over to Kyle. Kyle was red-faced. His face was brighter than his red t-shirt or strawberry blonde hair which was pushed up by a visor, and he was drinking a Corona. He grinned and held up his tongs. Kyle Muster in the house. I looked down at the grills. He was burning a lot of meat. <laughs> I'm never doing kids face painting again, I said. I saw some of your victims. I've never seen so many grumpy children. <laughs> I blamed it on the parents. Two guys at the volleyball court were shouting for two more players. Come on, guys, anyone? I looked at Kyle and raised an eyebrow. Fancy kicking some ass? Kyle shrugged. Oh, I don't know. I've got a row of fresh chicken on. I turned to a guy standing next to him in a blue polo shirt. I grabbed a pair of tongs on the, on the side of the barbecue grill and pushed them in his hands. Your turn, I shouted. I grabbed Kyle's wrist and dragged him behind me. Volleyball was my forte. We assumed position and began to seriously kick ass. We took the game to the next level big time. We took 30 points in about 10 minutes. Then, all of a sudden, when we weren't even playing, Kyle started rubbing his eye furiously. Ow, he cried. What's up? I got something in my eye. He kept rubbing and rubbing. It was awful. I begged him to stop. Is there a doctor in the house? One of the volleyball guys shouted. Kyle was certainly scratching his retina. A woman from upstairs, who was a doctor, rushed over. She made him kneel back and she poured water into his eye. He opened and closed it. It still hurts, he said. I think you should go and get it checked out, the doctor said. 
She was a small, slight woman with dark, bobbed hair. She spoke in low tones. Someone said that if we were in America and you didn't have health care, you'd be fucked. Carl's flatmate and I went with him to the hospital. One week later, Carl didn't have a left eye. He blamed it on the sand. Okay, um, so the next piece is very short, it's called Book. Um, and you might recognize one of the characters. I was bombing around Charing Cross one afternoon, wandering around the National Portrait Gallery and National Gallery, and generally being a tourist to save off boredom when I met Vault. He was a tall, thickly set man who actually looked more like a hippie than a scholar, with wide, fan shaped hands and wide blue eyes. He carried a worn out backpack with green piece badges. He was looking at a photograph of Alexander Scholzenitsyn and taking notes in a small notepad when I wandered over and whispered, has anyone ever told you you look like Frank Black? Who? Frank Black, the lead singer of the Pixies, the band? As it turned out, Walt had exceptional taste in Russian 19th century literature, which is what he was doing his PhD in, even though he was clueless on modern culture. I always wanted to study Russian literature, I said when we first met. My bookshelf is your bookshelf, he told me later, when we went back to his flat and ended up having sex on a shaggy rug. And so it was. We didn't end up going out, you know, like boyfriend, girlfriend. We just had sex a few times, but I got the feeling that Walt thought we were dating. In those few months, I managed to borrow quite a few books from him. The first night, I obtained some Chekhov, Gogol, and Dostoevsky. After the first month, he gently asked when I might return his first edition Gogol. That book? Uh, I needed to write my dissertation? My excuses were feeble, but the truth was that I loved those books. One thing led to another, and the next thing I knew, I woke up and he was lying next to me on my bed, unclothed apart from my yellow daisy sheet. You fell asleep, he said. Uh, I can see. I lay in bed for a while, thinking about the significance of what sleeping with Walt might mean. He might think he's my boyfriend now. Walt, meanwhile, padded away, wearing my sheet like a toga, which half trailed behind him. Hey, this is mine, I heard from the living room. And this, and this. He came back into the room with the book. I think this is mine. I shrugged and lit a cigarette. It's not exactly like I keep track, lie, is it? It sure is. He opened up the front cover and the first few pages. It's definitely mine because my name's written on the inside. <laughs> Take it then. Walt stared at me. It's not just this one, it's all of them. I followed him into the living room. That whole row of books. He said I could borrow them. Walt looked deeply into me and shook his head. He never took me seriously intellectually. That's what put me off, actually. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to read you one more story for tonight. It's set in Puerto Rico, and um, it's completely the opposite of what you've just been hearing. So fasten your seatbelts, and we're going to get off. <laughs> um, it's called Ceramic Birds. I was waiting in the airport lounge, feeling like a terrorist suspect who defected from an 80s movie and fast forward to 2013. Hawaiian shirt, khaki army pants, ridiculous snow boots, and three pieces of hand luggage full of ceramics from Guatemala. San Juan was the meeting point where Pilar, my ex-wife, said we had to meet. No one in goddamn lax told me this flight would detour, that snowstorms would be hitting New York, and that my ex-wife couldn't be trusted. Pilar, the bitch. She seemed to find a way to use our son for emotional blackmail every time I wanted to see him, even though it was her decision to move back to PR. This time, here I was, lugging a bunch of ceramics. I was waiting in what felt like a bus station waiting area in Beirut. Plastic seats, men with permatans on cell phones staring bullet holes into me. Teenage mothers in silver studded jeans and bare midriffs pushing families of eight by themselves, jabbering incessantly on Diamante cell phones. Outside, the city was baking. That's what this place does, doesn't it? Bake? 
But the sky was fresh blue, like a sheet stretched out, nice and wide, and palm trees lined the road, almost like it was a nice place to live. I couldn't help but fidget. Three hours of sleep and a 10 hour layover in JFK will slash anyone's nerves. The room smelled of fresh paint and stolen credit cards, disgusting aftershave and drugstore perfume. I watched a security guard in a blue polyester uniform talking to another guard. They seemed to be talking to about one dude's cousin who got in trouble, then they were laughing. My knees, the shakes, I needed to smoke. I looked at the three identical cases, identical, black, large. If Susie was here, she would have said the ceramic was the euphemism and raised her dark, tidy eyebrows in that way that she did, the way that she did when she wanted something extra. Unfortunately, it was the living truth. I unzipped one of the bags where I managed to squeeze a pair of Brazilian sandals and glanced at the ridiculous bowls, plates, and birds wrapped up in newspaper hiding underneath. Earthenware creations thrown by wobbly peasant hands and painted in gaudy Van Gogh style flowers. I couldn't see the appeal. And these birds, ceramic birds, pieces of crap. Why can't you ship this shit? I'd ask my ex-wife. Surely it would be cheaper. Uh, Bob, maybe you'd like to see your kid, our kid, remember him, Louise? <laughs> oh yeah, you mean that kid we had that Tommy pretended to be on the pill? Fuck you, Bob. Why do you always have to talk about Luis like that? Like he was my fault. You know we wanted him. I couldn't argue with her. Mistake or no mistake, Louise was a beautiful child with dark, shiny hair and almond eyes, who was half me and half her, and too young to fly out on his own. That made sense. It was the demands that got me, always exacting, with the cost. Artisan's boutique on my card? No way. My feet sang as I slid them into the well-worn rubber flip-flops, bright green with a black trim, classic. I stood up, wriggled my toes, and pulled out one of the cases and reached into my front pocket. As I neared the young guard with a razor stripe in his eyebrow and faint goatee, I whispered to him in Spanish, do me a favor, take these cases outside and give them a good kicking and bring them back in when you're done. The youth's eyes widened, but he nodded assent when I slipped him a 20. I smiled as I lit and inhaled a galois just outside. What an oven! I watched the guard and his mate pull the three cases outside, then sat upon them with their steel toes. I enjoyed the scene. Pilar's Guatemalan luxury pieces set me back by at least a grand, but this was priceless. The look on her face when she opened the cases. Just as the guards were wheeling the cases back inside, a smart blue Peugeot pulled up. The window slid down. I saw the Gucci frames. My ex-wife, Pilar. Oh, what a shame about your flight, huh? She said, touching her red hair and pushing up the shades. I enjoyed watching Pilar look around for the bags and back at me. She clearly didn't care about me. So where are they? She asked. I ignored my ex-wife. My son, Luis, who sat in the front seat, exclaimed, you made it. I touched Louise's fine hair. I did make it. Great to see you, kid. I can't believe you came all this way, Louise said, just to pick me up. Me either. Pilar's dark eyes flashed. The bags? She puffed. What? Oh, oh, they're just inside. Hang on. Pilar's shoulders relaxed. I ran back inside, winked at the guards, and wheeled the luggage to the car. When I came back, Louise and Pilar were standing outside of the car, waiting for me. Louise had a small dinosaur suitcase, and Pilar held this blue lightweight jacket in her arm. The trunk was wide open. I knew my role. Lift, place, fuck off. <laughs> Pilar smiled at the three black cases, then at me. Keep the cases, I said. You're too kind, Pilar said. I slammed the trunk down and watched Pilar shimmy to the driver's seat and get in. The kid and I stood on the curb, a unit. Louise waved to Pilar. I'll miss you, mommy. Be good now, she said. Less grateful now that she had what she wanted, Pilar made eyes at me. Three months, then he's back here. Sure, I agreed. No requests this time. Pilar ignored me and drove off, and I followed the taillights of her car. Then I looked up at the sun, the sky, the expanse of sky. There was an unbelievable kindness and generosity up in that sky. 
Thank you.